Hi, my name is Jan Blake, and I am the chair of the Robinson Subcommittee of the College Historical Society, in short, the HIST. This podcast series shows the derbies of rhetoric events, which are our well-known events organized, consisting of seven minutes speech on any topic. Previous speeches have ranged from Guella and Trinity to American muscle cars, so there's sure to be something for everyone. Enjoy listening. Our brain never really rests. The dreams we have constantly are the perfect demonstration and illustration of this. Right now, at this very moment, your brain perhaps is listening to the words I'm saying. Perhaps first getting the sound signals from your ears. Translate them to meaningful ideas and information. And then perhaps your brain is also receiving the message that you're hungry because it is 12 already. Maybe it is also getting disturbed by the stunning bird passing by your window. Maybe it starts feeling attraction for me speaking, starts dreaming about going out for dinner later this week with a French martini cocktail. Maybe. But all this happening, all these thoughts, are nothing but electricity and chemicals. Yes, your brain is a hotbed of electrochemical activity. About a hundred billion neurons are each firing off five to fifty messages per second. Right now. And the next moment. And the moment following after. And there are hundreds of other stunning, disturbing, intriguing, overwhelming facts and figures about that. Three pounds. The human brain weight. 10% the use of our capacities. 60% the ratio of fat in the brain. The human brain has the capacity to generate approximately 23 watts of power when awake. Of the total blood and oxygen that is produced in our body, the brain gets 20% of it. When the blood supply to the brain stops, it is almost after 8 to 10 seconds that the brain starts losing the consciousness. The brain is capable of surviving for 5 to 6 minutes only if it doesn't get oxygen, after which it dies. The blood vessels that are present in the brain are almost a 100 thousand miles in length. There are a hundred billion neurons present in the brain. Then, behind this, behind all these facts, how does the brain really work? This conductor of the organism and of our movements, the headquarter of our thoughts and perceptions, the command center of many vital functions. While our understanding of this strange organ improves, it remains a big mystery. One of them is that one day it stops working properly and is worsens and is irreversible. And when the other cells of the body are constantly renewing themselves like the bones, the brain does not, except for a few minor regions of the brain from recent discoveries, but the brain does not renew itself. Above the age of three years old, all your neurons that you will have for your entire life have already been created, and this in a very fast fashion actually. From the fetus to now, all your neurons were there since you're three years old. This brain not working properly sometimes. 
is not fully understood yet. Despite many recent discoveries and research outlining several hypotheses, genetics appears to be involved. Other random dysfunctioning involving proteins and their breakdown. We more and more know what is happening. We know the reasons, but we don't know why. Those reasons of the reasons. We don't understand why. We just understand how. But even the how isn't properly, precisely already understood. How that way. How that other way. It is very complex. And the compensation for this deficiency is today impossible on the brain. While on the medicine side, we do not have yet the necessary tools and knowledge to cure the disease, most of the resources of information systems and information technology exist and are already well known and mastered. With information systems, tomorrow patients with Alzheimer's disease could live their lives the same way they did before being seriously affected by the disease. Tomorrow, patient carers could be relieved from an enormous and stressful responsibility. Tomorrow, we could lead research in nanotechnologies tackling the biological phenomena causing Alzheimer's disease, which have been detailed in all their hypotheses. Tomorrow, the diagnosis of patients could have a full reliability and be accessible to all people around the world. That is what information systems can bring forward. And it is wise to simplify the main problem posed by the disease to an extremely disruption of an information system. That is the human brain. It follows then that if not treating the disease, the best way to compensate for this damaged system would be to associate it with a complementary functional information system. This is ultimately what happens for most of the assistants, carers and the family. Their brains act as a complementary information system, which explains the enormous fatigue these surrounding people encounter. It is therefore essential to consider other alternative information system solutions, in particular computer-based information systems. It is also important to admit that at present, the information systems that are the human brains that accompany patients are, even at their maximum capacity, not sufficient to compensate even for the symptoms of early phase of Alzheimer's disease. There is a lot of promising advances to be made, and it is important to have this philosophy in mind, that it is not wrong to go beyond human-based solutions to implement information systems and even artificial intelligence in order to compensate these problems. That even though a lot of the care won't be handled well by a machine, a lot of what is made currently can be compensated that way. The research in that sense, of which I am part, are very promising, and I wanted today to share this perspective of a better future that seems extremely important to me. Thank you for listening.